This is the review for test two in Math 11.11. Um, so these are similar type problems, the same phrasing, the same type problems that you'll see on test two within Newton. And I'm going to try to work through these examples for you. So question one says find the Y intercept of the following line and it gives you the equation. First of all you need to remember that the y-intercept is where the graph crosses the y-axis. So it's called the y-intercept. It's where the graph crosses the y-axis and we solve for y. So it's y, y, y. That's how I remember it. So to solve for y, we're going to let x equal 0. And I'm going to substitute that into the given equation. So I'd have y equals 0 minus 6. So y equals negative 6. Typically the answer is written as an ordered pair. Remember that an ordered pair is in the form x comma y. So our answer would be 0 comma negative 6. That's your y-intercept. The second question says to find the x-intercept of the following line, and it's the same line. For the x-intercept, the x-intercept is where the graph crosses the y ax or excuse me, the x-axis. The x-intercept is where the graph crosses the x-axis. So we need to solve for x. X-intercept crosses x-axis, solve for x, 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 okay? So in this case, we let y equals 0, and we want to solve for x. So I would have 0 equals x minus 6, Then I'm trying to solve for the x, so I'm going to add 6 to either side to isolate the x, so I have 6 equals x. Again, typically our answer is written as an ordered pair. And so we would have 6 comma 0. There's your x-intercept. Question 3 says to find the slope of the line through the points 7, negative 1 and 0, negative 6. So to find the slope, the slope represents the tilt or the slant of the line and we have a formula that allows us to do that calculation. The formula for slope, which is represented by the lowercase m, is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. You may be familiar with it as rise over run. So basically we're going to substitute into this formula and perform the calculations. Now I like to label my points so I don't get confused. It doesn't matter which one you label as the first point, which one you label as the second point. So for the first one, I just go left to right. So my first ordered pair would be x1, y1. The second ordered pair is x2, y2. And then I'm going to substitute those values into the formula. So I have negative 6 minus negative 1 over 0 minus 7. Okay, so then you have to do the math. You could use a calculator, okay, but I'm going to write it out. Okay, so negative 6 minus a minus 1 is really negative 6 plus 1 over 0 minus 7 is negative 7. 
negative 6 plus 1 is negative 5 over negative 7. Remember, a negative divided by a negative is positive. So ultimately, our slope is positive 5 sevenths. Question 4 says find the equation of the line through the points 9, negative 2, and 1, 6. And it wants you to put your final answer in slope-intercept form. So we need a few things here. First of all, to write the equation of a line, you need to know two things. To write the equation of the line, you need to know the slope. and you need to know a point that the line passes through. Well, in this particular case, I have two points. So I have a point. It doesn't matter which one I use. Since I'm not overly fond of negatives, I'm going to use the point 1, 6. But I don't have the slope, but I do have enough information to find the slope. So in this scenario, I really have to, the first thing I have to do is to find the slope using that same technique that we just used on question three. My slope formula, again, is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm going to label one point x1, y1, and x2, y2. And again, it doesn't matter which one is which. Okay, so I switched it up this time just to show you that it doesn't matter. Then we're going to substitute in. So I would have negative 2 minus 6 over 9 minus 1. Okay, so negative 2 minus 6 is negative 8, 9 minus 1 is positive 8, negative 8 divided by positive 8 is negative 1. So the slope that I need to use for this problem is negative 1. After I find the slope and I have selected a point from the two that were given, then I'm going to use the point slope form or formula, if you will, to help me write the equation. So that formula is y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1. m is your slope. And x1, y1 is your point. And so again, it becomes a substitution problem into that formula. So I have y equals my slope is negative 1 times x minus x1 was 1 plus y1 is 6. The other thing you have to remember is that it ultimately asks you to put your answer in slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. So basically, I've got to take this equation that I just created and simplify it. I need to distribute and get rid of the parentheses and combine like terms. So I'm going to distribute the negative 1. So I have y equals negative 1x. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1 plus 6. So I have y equals negative 1x plus 7. Now, oftentimes, since that is a 1 in front of the x, you'll see it written without the 1. It would be probably written y equals negative x 
plus 7. Remember the 1 is often understood. <clears throat> so in that particular case, guys, you got to think it through and it's more than one step. To write the equation of the line, you always have to know the slope and a point. In this case, we didn't have the slope, but I could find it using the slope formula. And then we substitute into point slope formula to ultimately get our equation of the line. Question five says, find the equation of the line through which, or through, excuse me, negative one seven, which is parallel to the line y equals x plus 4. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on here that you need to pay attention to. Again, they're asking us to write the equation of a line. So to, again, to write the equation of the line, you got to know the slope and you got to know a point. Again, they've given us a point but the other piece here is that they want us to write the equation that is parallel to the one that is given. So not only do I need the slope, I actually need the parallel slope. Now what you have to remember here about parallel lines is that parallel lines have the same slope. Parallel lines have the same slope. So I need to look at the equation that I'm given. Y equals um, 8x plus 4, which is in slope intercept form. Remember our slope intercept form is Y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope. So m is the number in front of the x. So the slope of the given line is 8. Therefore, the slope of the line that I want to create, or the parallel slope, is also 8. So now I have my slope, okay, so I have my parallel slope that I need. I have a point, so here's x1, y1, and I'm going to again use the point slope form the equation, okay, so I'm going to use point slope, which is y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1, and I'm going to substitute my values into that equation. So I have y equals 8 times x minus the negative 1 plus 7. So I'm going to simplify this a little bit. So I have 8 times x minus the minus is plus 1 plus 7. Again, we're asked to write it ultimately in slope intercept form, so I need to distribute and eliminate my parentheses. So I have y equals 8 times x is 8x, 8, 8 times positive 1 is plus 8 plus 7. Combining like terms, we have y equals 8x plus 15. So the equation of the line that is parallel to 8x plus 4 is y equals 8x plus 15. Question 6 ask us to find the equation of the line through the point negative 4, 5, which is perpendicular to y equals 1 fourth x minus 1. Okay, so here again, they've asked us to write the equation of the line. To write the equation of the line, we have to know the slope 
and we have to know a point. Okay, so we were given a point, but again, here in this case, the slope, we need it to be perpendicular to the equation that's given. Okay, so we actually need the perpendicular slope. Okay, perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocals. Okay, that's a little bit trickier, but we'll talk about it. Okay, let me scroll down so I can have some space to write. Okay, so looking at the equation that we're given, okay, here you have y equals mx plus b. Okay, so the given slope here is positive one-fourth. We're looking for or we need the perpendicular slope. Okay, and again I've indicated it's negative reciprocal. Okay, so the idea of reciprocal is flip it over. So it becomes 4 over 1. Negative means to change the sign. So it was originally 1 fourth, so I flipped it over, it becomes 4 over 1, and you change the sign. If it had been originally negative, then I would have changed it to positive. That's the idea of a negative reciprocal. Flip it over, change the sign. So this simplifies to negative 4. So the slope that we need for this problem, which represents the perpendicular slope, is negative 4. We also then have our point. So we have x1, y1. And we're going to substitute again into our point slope formula. So y equals m times x minus x1 plus y1. Guys, notice that each time I write the formula down, okay, it helps me so that, that when I start to plug in the numbers, I get them all in the right place. Okay, don't shortcut it. So I have y equals my perpendicular slope is negative 4 times x minus the negative 4 plus 5. And again, I'm going to simplify that just a little bit. Some of you may be able to jump straight to that, and that's fine. So I have y equals negative 4 times x plus 4. Negative and a negative make a positive plus 5. Okay, let me give me a little bit more space here. Then I need to ultimately put it into slope intercept form, which means I need to distribute and collect like terms. So I have y equals, I thought I changed colors, let me go back here and get a different color. Okay, so we have y equals negative 4 times x is negative 4x. Negative 4 times 4 is negative 16 plus 5. So then I have y equals negative 4x. Negative 16 plus 5 is minus or negative 11. So the ultimate equation that we need is y equals negative 4x minus 11. Okay, the next question says solve the system, following system of equations, write the answer as an ordered pair. So it's a system and the system means you have two equations or you could have three equations and you want to try to find the um, 
answer that satisfies or makes both statements true. There are a couple of techniques that you can use for solving a system of equation. We can use what's called the substitution method. Or we can use the elimination method, sometimes called the addition method. And it's really up to you if you prefer one method over the other, you're welcome to do that. Um, sometimes it depends upon how the equations are given to you. Usually we use the substitution method if one of the equations is already solved for either X or Y. And so when I look at the two equations for question seven, neither of them are solved for X or Y. So, and if it's not, you know, maybe I could solve it for one of the variables or I can use the elimination method. I personally prefer the elimination method. So for question seven, just so you'll have it as an example, I'm going to use the elimination method. Okay, so I noticed that, let's see, I want to put it together so that I can, when I add these things, one of the variables is eliminated. So I want to have the opposite sign in front of one of them. So I'm going to multiply the first equation by negative 4. And I choose negative 4 because I need to make the number in front of the y to be a 4, but I also need it to be positive. Okay, so then I'm going to write this off to the side. I'm going to have negative 20x plus 4y equals negative 4 times negative 18. Let's see, I'm going to get my calculator. Negative 4 times negative 18 is positive 72. And then I'm going to bring the other equation just right over underneath that so that I have 3x minus 4y equals 13. And then I'm going to add those two equations together. So I have negative 20x plus 3x is negative 17x four, plus 4y four minus 4y four zeroes out, which is what I needed to happen. And then I have 72 plus 13, which is 85. And so then I have a basic equation, negative 17x equals 85. And I need to solve that for x. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative 17. Negative 17. So x equals 85 divided by negative 17 is negative 5. So I've determined that my x value is negative 5. To find the y value I need to substitute back into one of the original equations. It really doesn't matter which one. I'm going to go back up here to this one. Okay, so I would have 3 times negative 5 minus 4y equals 13. Okay, I'm going to do the math. 3 times negative 5 is negative 15 minus 4y equals 13. Then I'm trying to solve for y, so I'm going to add 15 to either side. Negative 4y equals 28. I'm going to divide both sides by four, negative 4. So y equals negative 7. And it wants me to ultimately write my final answer as an ordered pair. So as an ordered pair, my final answer is negative 5 
negative 7. Now guys, there's a way to check yourself here because negative 5, negative 7 should make both of the original equations true. So take a minute and plug and chug. Okay, so if I take a minute and I plug and chug, I have 5 times negative 5 minus negative 7, and that should be negative 18. I have negative 25 plus 7, which is negative 18, which equals negative 18. So it worked for the first one. Then I check the second one. 3 times negative 5 minus 4 times negative 7 should be positive 13. So I have negative 15 plus 28 equals 13. Negative 15 plus 28 does equal 13. So I have verified by taking just a quick minute to go back and substitute back into the original problem our problems, original equations, and proven that my answer is correct. All right, question eight, I believe is a similar question. It says solve the following system of equations and write your answer as an ordered pair. Well, one of the things that I noticed about this particular problem is that the first equation is already solved for x. So this would be a good use of the substitution method since the first equation is already solved for x. So I'm going to take the equation that's solved for x and substitute it into the second one wherever there is an x. So I would have, let me see if I can color code this for you. 5 times negative y minus 9, see I took the x out and replaced it, minus 6y equals negative 1. And then I need to simplify that, so I'm going to distribute the 5. 5 times negative y is negative 5y. 5 times minus 9 is negative 45 minus 6y equals negative 1. Combining like terms, I have negative 5y minus 6y, which is negative 11y minus 45 equals negative 1. I'm then going to add 45 to either side to isolate the y. I have negative 11y equals 44. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 11. So y equals negative 4. Now that I have the y, I can go back to the original equation and I can substitute. So I'm going to take this back up here and I'm going to substitute. So I have x equals negative of negative 4 minus 9. So negative of a negative is positive minus 9. 4 minus 9 is negative 5. So my x value is negative 5. And again, we're asked to write it as an ordered pair. So as an ordered pair, my answer would be negative 5, negative 4. Remember, it's always x comma y. So then again, I can take a quick minute and check myself. Okay, let's see if I can do it right up here above this. Okay, so we would have negative 5 equals the opposite of negative 4 minus 9. So negative 5 equals 4 minus 9. Negative 5 does equal negative 5. So it checks in the first one. Then I'm going to check the second one. 5 times negative 5 minus 6 
times negative 4 should be negative 1. So I have negative 25 plus 24 negative 1 does equal negative 1. So again, I have taken a quick minute and verified that it actually works in both equations, which guarantees that I have the question correct. Now guys, if you have trouble doing the math, like the multiplying with the, the signed numbers, please use a calculator. Alright, question 9 then gets us into the discussion more so of functions. And it says determine whether negative 9x minus 3y squared equals 6 is a function. Guys, there are several ways that you can do this. Um, you can look at it from a graphical perspective. And if you look at it from a graph perspective, we use the vertical line test. Um, sometimes you can tell by looking at the equation itself. Um, it's a little bit harder to do that. What I would encourage you to do is solve this equation for y. So, and then maybe try to create the graph or think about it from that perspective. So I'm going to solve this for y, okay? Because when you're looking at whether it's a function or not, here's what you got to think about. A function is a relation in which no two ordered pairs have the same first component and different second components. You have no repeat of the x values. So if I so I'm going to solve this for y. Okay, so I would add 9x to either side. So I have negative 3y squared equals 6 plus 9x. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 3. Every piece gets divided by negative 3. So I have y squared equals negative 2 minus 3x. And then I'm going to have to take the square root to get rid of the square. And when I take the square root, I get both the positive and the negative. So I have y equals positive and negative, negative 2 minus 3x. So a couple of things in my mind here when I solve this, and it comes out that I'm going to have plus or minus, that tells me whatever number I plug in for x, I'm going to get two different answers. And even if you don't realize that just from the equation, try picking yourself some a few data values. Okay, so let's say that I pick, I'm going to use, um, let's say, negative 2. Okay, I just picked a number. So if I substitute negative 2 in here, I have y equals plus or minus negative 2 minus 3 times negative 2, which gives me plus or minus the square root of negative 2 plus 6. So I have plus or minus the square root of 4. Square root of 4 is 2. And so I get a value of either positive 2 or I get a value of negative 2. So I have the same x value gives me two y values, and you cannot have the repetition in the x. So this particular function, and again, it, that's a little bit challenging to see. If you can create the graph, okay, um, you would have an ellipse. You would have basically a graph that looks sort of like this, okay, and it would fail the vertical line test, okay. So this particular thing is not a function because you have that repetition in the x values. It's really hard to see, but it's ideally you could create the graph. 
I don't have the ability to do that here on my computer. Um, I don't have a graphing calculator. All right, question 10, again, is still addressing um, whether which one is a function. It says, of the relations represented by the tables below, is the output a function of the input? And select all the correct answers. Okay, guys, first of all, it says select all the correct answers, which means there could be more than one. Again, the deal with the function, to be a function, you can have no repeat of the x values. So if I look at this first one, we have 7, 3, negative 4, 10, negative 1, 7, and negative 1, 0. I have negative 1 paired with 0 and with 7. This is not a function. Then I move on to the second one. I have 1, negative 1, 5, 12, negative 5, 9, 0, 12. There's no repetition in the x values, and so this particular one is a function. So I would mark the second one. Then looking at the third one, negative 1 paired with negative 1, negative 1 paired with 3. Oop, that's already a problem I see because you have negative 1 paired with 3 and negative 1 paired with negative 1. So again, this is not a function. All right, then we go to the fourth one. 7 paired with 9, 5 paired with 7, negative 2 with 9, and 0 paired with 3. There's no repetition in the x, so this one would also be a function. And then looking at the last one, I have 0 paired with 6, 0 paired with 7. Okay, so there again, I have the repetition in the x value, so this one is not a function. Guys, you have to take your time and look carefully, and you have to look at them all because there could be more than one correct answer. Please do not rush and overlook one of them. Okay, then question 11 says, which of the following graphs represent a function? And it select, again says, select all that apply. So there could be more than one correct answer. And again, from a graphical perspective, we use the vertical line test. If the vertical line only crosses the graph once at any given point, then it is considered a function. So if we visualize vertical lines all the way across this first graph, anywhere that I draw one, I'm only crossing the graph one time. So this one would be a function. If I look at the second one, um, there in most places, a lot of the places where I would draw a vertical line, I cross two times. I cannot cross two times and it be a function. So this one we would say no. The third one gets kind of tricky because of the curve, but if you draw it in the right place, you could cross two times. Okay, other times you may only cross one time, but if you cross more than once at any point, it's not a function, so this would be a no. And then for the last one, the last option, again, if I visualize those vertical lines, I'm only going to cross one time, so this would be yes. Again, you have to take your time, guys. You got to pay attention. There could be more than one answer.
Question 12 says the function g is defined as g of x equals negative 4x minus 3. Find g at negative 1. The intent of this question is just to get you familiar with the use of function notation. And now instead of using y, we use g of x or f of x or h of x. Okay, and basically what they're asking you to do here is plug and chug. This tells you to substitute the value negative 1 for x into the given function, which is g. Okay, so if I'm going to do g at negative 1, that means I'm going to substitute negative 1 in place of x in the equation or the formula that's given and do the math. So negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4 minus 3. 4 minus 3 is 1. So g at negative 1 is 1. Guys, please don't overthink it. Okay, it's not supposed to be challenging. It's just getting you familiar with how to use that function notation, which is used throughout college algebra, through pre-calculus, into calculus, and higher level math courses. Question 13 is similar. Again, they're getting you familiar with that notation. It gives you the function and asks you to find f at negative 1. So again, they're asking you to take a value of negative 1 and substitute it into the function wherever there is an x. So f at negative 1, I would have negative 3 times negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1 plus 1. Now again, if you have the need to use a calculator, please do so. I'm working it out by hand. So negative 3, negative 1 squared, that's literally negative 1 times negative 1, which is going to be positive 1. Negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2 plus 1. Then I go back, negative 3 times 1 is negative 3, plus 2, plus 1. So negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. So f at negative 1 is 0. Okay, question 14 says find the domain of the function represented by the list of order pairs. The domain of any function is the x values. The domain is the x values. If you're asked for the range, the range is the y values. Okay, and we basically make a list. Okay, and so we use the letter D for domain, and we make the list. And normally we put them in order from smallest to largest. So I would have negative 7, negative 5, negative 2, and 6. Again, we typically list them from the smallest to the largest. And I'm listing the X values, which is the first number in each set of parentheses. Now it doesn't ask me here to find the range, but should it ask you to find the range, range is R and it is the Y values. And again, we normally put them in order from low to high. So we would have negative 11, 7, 8, and 10. Okay, so that's a little extra there because you weren't really asked to find the range. Okay, question 15 says to find the domain of the function, write the answer in interval notation. So again, domain is the x values. You have to pay attention to the graph. Okay, I notice on this graph I have this open circle. 
the open circle means it is not included on the graph. On the other side, I have a closed dot. Closed dot means it's included. If you don't have dots and it just keeps kind of appears to keep going, we have to assume that it does keep going um, on and on and on and on in the direction um, that it appears to be going. Okay, so we're looking for the domain. So when you're looking for the domain, think about you're going to get on the x-axis and you start walking. And as you're walking, you look up and down. And the first place on the x-axis that I'm going to see a point is at negative 6. But I don't really see it at negative 6 because that point's not included. So I would use a parenthesis. When things are not included, we use a parenthesis. Then we keep going. I still see something at negative 5. I still see something at negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1. When I get to 2, I don't see anything. So I stop seeing things when I get to a value of positive 1, and it is included. Okay, so I use a square bracket. When you're writing an interval notation, if it's included, we use a square bracket for the interval notation. If it's not included, it's a parenthesis. That's how you have to distinguish between whether you can use the point or not use the point. And again, the domain, you're looking for where do you see it in terms of the X. The next question, if I'm not mistaken, is the same graph, but it asks you to find the range. The range of any function is the y values. Okay, and again, you still have to pay attention to whether you have an open dot, which means it's not included. or whether you have a closed dot, which means it is included. Okay, same deal with interval notation here with the interval notation included gets a bracket because that means it can be used. Not included gets a parenthesis. My focus now is on the Y. So if I get on the Y axis and I start climbing up, the first place that I see something on the Y axis is at negative 5. So I begin to see something at negative 5. The dot's colored in, so it's included. Let me kind of adjust that a little bit, guys. Okay, so we first see something at negative 5. I still see things at negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, 1, 0. When I get to 1, I still see something over here. But when I get to 2, I don't. Okay, but when I get to 1, that point is not included. So my range goes from negative 5 to positive 1. Okay, when finding the domain and the range, guys, it depends on your perspective. Domain is X, range is Y. Every time, all the time. Alright, question 17 asks us to determine the intervals for which the function is decreasing. Okay, decreasing. So decreasing, I hope you realize, makes sense, is that you're going down. Okay, it's getting smaller, so it's going down from a visual perspective. 
in terms of writing the answer and it wants you to write the intervals so that implies you want to use interval notation And for determining the intervals where it's increasing and decreasing, we always use X values. We always state it in terms of the X values. And the other thing that I'll say here is that the endpoints are not included. Okay, anytime you're doing the intervals for increasing or decreasing, your beginning points and ending points are not included. So if I look at this graph, okay, and we start on the left hand side, we always work left to right. Okay, I appear to be going up. Okay, this is up. So I'm not interested in that. Then when I get to zero, when I get to this point, which is zero, four, then I do actually start going down. It's like I'm on a slide. I'm going down until I get to the point two, zero. And then I again start climbing the mountain and I'm going up. So remember, I'm looking for where it's decreasing, so I want to know where is it going down, and I start going down at a X value of zero, and I stop at a y X value of two. So I start at zero, I stop at two, and I'm not going to include either endpoint. It's as though these endpoints are open circles. They're not colored in. So I decrease along the interval from 0 to 2. At any point between those two numbers, I appear to be going down or decreasing. Alright, the next question is the same graph, but now it asks you for where is the function increasing. Increasing implies that you're going up, okay, or getting bigger. The values are getting bigger. Again, the fact that it asks you for the interval or intervals, it could be more than one, that implies we want to use interval notation. Again, we're going to use the X values. And the endpoints are not included. Okay, that's always the case when you're thinking about increasing and decreasing. Now, this may look a little wonky, but this also shows the explanation of what I was talking about a while ago. Notice that at the end of this graph, there's not like a circle or a colored in dot. So I have to assume that this is like an arrow and that it keeps going forever and ever and ever in that direction. Similarly, on the right hand side, I have to assume that it keeps going up forever and ever and ever in that direction. Anytime visually when we want it to stop on a graph, we would put in the colored in dot or we put in the um, open dot. Okay, so we have to assume this graph keeps going on forever and ever. So forever and ever in mathematics is called infinity. And it's represented, it looks like a sideways 8. And I'm on the low end or the left side, so that would be negative. And on the right side, again, we go to infinity, sideways 8, but it's positive, okay, negative and positive numbers. So again, in this case, we're looking for where is it increasing. 
And so with respect to the X, I have to assume it keeps going and going and going. So I would begin increasing at negative infinity. And I'm going to keep going until I get to the top of the hill, which occurs at the ordered pair 0, 4. The x value there is 0. Neither endpoint is included. We use a little funky looking u. Mathematically, that means or. We already noted that between 0 and 2, we were decreasing. But then, after I get to the bottom of the slide, I have to start climbing back up the hill again. So I'm going up again, and I start at 2, and I keep going forever and ever. Okay, so the points or the intervals where I'm increasing is from negative infinity to zero or from positive two to positive infinity. All right, question 19 says, given the function shown below, find the average rate of change between negative 5 and 20. Okay, so the average rate of change is a similar concept to slope. Slope relates only to lines. When we begin to relate it to curves like we have here, it's called average rate of change. So the formula looks a little funky. Okay, we write it delta y over delta x. Okay, that's usually the formula for average rate of change. And so we would have, and in terms of the function notation, you would have f of x sub 2 minus f of x sub 1 over x2 minus x1. Now guys, that's really the same thing that we had earlier for slope. We're saying y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Again, average rate of change is the same idea as slope. Slope only applies to lines. Average rate of change applies to graphs. And they're telling us that they want us to look at the interval from 5 to 20. So they're giving me my x's from x1 to x2. So on my graph, if I look at 5, I'm going to have 5, comma, 10. There's my ordered pair. And then if I look at 20, I would have 20, comma, 40. I'm basically going to try to find, whoops, I'm a little off there, sorry. But you're trying to determine the slope of the line that connects those two points. Okay, so I have, I've identified my points from the graph. I have x1, y1, or that's the same as f of x1. And I have x2, comma, y2. Y2 is the same as f of x sub 2. The notation changes slightly because we're talking about a function. It's okay. It's still formula based. So I'm going to plug and chuck. So I have 40 minus 10 over 20 minus 5. That gives me, doing the math, 40 minus 10 is 30. 20 minus 5 is 15. 15, or excuse me, 30 divided by 15 is 2. So the average rate of change here is 2. Or again, or this tilt of this line that connects those two points 
is 2. Okay, number 20 again is asking you to find that average rate of change and it wants you to go from 0 to 3, but it doesn't give you the graph. Okay, so this one's going to require a little bit more work. But again, remember average rate of change is that same idea as slope. And this is like three problems in one. Okay, so you have really three different things you have to do. They've given you your x1 and your x2. So step one is I need to find f of x sub 1, which would be f at 0. So I'm going to plug and chug 0 into the given formula. So I have 0 cubed minus 0 squared minus 2 times 0 minus 4. Okay, so I'm going to do the math. Let's see what I get. I get 0 cubed is 0, minus 0 squared is 0, minus 2 times 0 is 0, minus 4. So 0 minus 0 minus 0 minus 4 is negative 4. So I have the ordered pair 0, negative 4. Okay, so I'm going to hold that thought for just a minute. There's my first point. Step two is I have to find f of x sub 2. So I got to find f at 3. So I'm going to substitute 3 into the function. So I have 3 cubed minus 3 squared minus 2 times 3 minus 4. Okay, I'm doing the math. 3 cubed, 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, minus 3 squared, 3 times 3 is 9, minus 2 times 3 is minus 6, minus 4. 27 minus 9 is 18, 18 minus 6 is 12, and 12 minus 4 is 8. So I end up with the ordered pair 3, 8. Okay, so now I have my two points, and I have my x1, y1, x2, y2. So I'm going to substitute into the average rate of change formula to ultimately get my answer here. So we have the average rate of change is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I have 8 plus 4 over 3. 8 plus 4 is 12 divided by 3 is 4. So my average rate of change is 4. But guys, there's three steps there. You have to find the individual points first and then substitute into the rate of change formula. This is ultimately your answer. Okay, I think we got a couple more, I think. All right, question 21 asks you to compute the difference quotient, and it gives you the formula for the difference quotient for this function that you have here. Okay, so this is... Um, again, kind of a, a three-step process, if you will. Okay, so in my quotient formula, I am given the f of x. This is given. So my first step is I need to find 
f of x plus h. Okay, it's a straight out substitution. We're going to plug in x plus h into the function. Okay, so I have the opposite of x plus h squared plus 2 times x plus h plus 1. Now, then you've got to try to simplify that. And guys, you need to be extra, extra careful. Remember, there's an understood 1 here. And that x plus h squared, so I really have negative 1 times x plus h times x plus h. Okay, so I'm going to do that piece first. And in doing it first, I'm going to multiply the x plus h times x plus h. And if you'll remember, we use good old foil for that. So I have the negative 1 is hanging out. Okay, so I'm going to put my negative 1 down here. So I have negative 1. And then I'm going to do the multiplying. x times x is x squared. x times h is hx. h times x is hx. And h times h is h squared. Okay, so I've done that multiplying. Then I need to distribute the negative 1 so that I have negative x squared minus hx minus hx minus h squared. And guys, I still have all this other stuff up here too. So I need to take care of this other stuff. Let me bring it down. Plus 2h plus 2x plus 2h plus 1. It didn't go away. And then I need to combine like terms so that ultimately for this piece I have negative x squared minus hx and minus hx is minus 2hx minus h squared plus 2x plus 2h plus 1. Woo! Okay, that is f of x plus h. Okay, then step two, we need to find f of x plus h minus f of x. That is the top half of your difference formula. So now I'm up to this piece right here. Okay. So my f of x plus h, I have negative x squared minus 2hx minus h squared plus 2x plus 2h plus 1, that's what we just calculated, minus f of x. And f of x is the original problem. Okay, f of x is the original problem. So my original problem was negative x squared plus 2x plus 1. And one of the biggest mistakes students make is they forget to do the subtraction or distribute the understood negative 1 here. Okay, so that's the biggest mistake students make. So let's see if we can avoid that. So we have negative x squared minus 2hx minus h squared plus 2x plus 2h plus 1 minus 1 times minus x is plus x squared. Minus 1 times 2x is minus 2x. And minus 1 times plus 1 is minus 1. And then I'm going back to combine like terms. 
negative x squared plus x squared zeroes out plus 2x minus 2x zeroes out plus 1 minus 1 zeroes out. So I'm left with 2hx minus h squared plus 2h. I'm not quite finished because then I have to finish out the formula. Okay, the remainder of the formula we have f of x plus h minus f of x, which we just calculated. We got to divide by h. Okay, so I have determined that the numerator value is 2hx minus h squared plus 2h. And I got to divide each individual piece by h, each individual piece. So I would have 2hx divided by h minus h squared divided by h plus 2h over h. And then I'm going to simplify. Okay, so I have an h in the numerator and an h in the denominator, both to divide out, so I have 2x minus, I have h, I have 2 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator. So that leaves me with 1h in the top plus h in the top, h in the bottom goes away, plus 2. So the difference quotient is 2x minus h plus 2. Guys, it's messy and it's lengthy, but if you'll break it down into those smaller pieces, kind of into those smaller problems, it's going to make it easier. And I believe we have one more, and it is again a difference quotient. Remember that in your difference quotient, the f of x is the given. Okay, so breaking it down again into smaller pieces, my first step is to find f of x plus h. So we substitute x plus h into the equation. So I have 2 times x plus h squared plus x plus h plus 2. And then we need to do the math. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we need to square x plus h. So we're going to do x plus h times x plus h, and we're going to use full. So I have the two times I'm going to have x times x is x squared x times h is hx x h times x is again hx h times h is h squared. Distributing the two, I could combine like terms first, but I'm going to distribute the two. So I have 2x squared plus 2hx plus 2hx plus 2h squared, and then I still have plus, there's a 1 there, so plus 1x plus 1h plus 2. And then the last step is to combine like terms. So I have 2x squared, 2hx plus 2hx makes 4hx plus 
8 squared plus x plus h plus 2. And that corresponds to f of x plus h. Then I'm going to deal with the numerator of my difference quotient. Okay, so then the second step is we're going to find f of x plus h minus f of x. Okay, that's the numerator. So I would have 2x squared plus 4hx plus 2h squared plus x plus h plus 2 minus, and my f of x is the given. So my given was 2x squared two x squared plus x plus two. Uh, again, the biggest mistake, so be extra, extra, extra careful, is distributing the negative. Two x squared plus four h x plus two h squared plus x plus h plus two minus 2x squared minus x minus 2. I had to distribute this negative. And finally, I'm going to come back and combine like terms. 2x squared minus 2x squared zeroes out. Um, 1x minus 1x zeroes out. Plus 2 minus 2 zeros out. So we have 4hx plus 2h squared plus h. That's the numerator of the difference quotient. And then step three is we have to come back and divide by h. So I take the answer that I just found, 4hx plus 2h squared plus h, and I divide it, okay, separate it out, 4hx over h plus 2h squared over h plus h over h. Okay, simplify it. So I have an h in the numerator, h in the denominator, 2 in the numerator, 1 in the denominator. This one, they're going to divide out, but remember h divided by h is 1. So I have 4x plus 2h plus 1. And there is my difference quotient. There you go, guys.